I want to appreciate my dad and my mom. Some of the things that you've seen today. I always say to my dad, you bring out the lioness in me. It brings out the lioness because when daddy speaks, I, I don't know. I, I just, and you always, they always say this woman is a, like a, a man, a woman like a man. But because I, I eat and I drink from, some, from a source, amen, I want to appreciate you both, ma and son, you know, for all that you have deposited in my life through your messages, through your counsel, through the books, through everything. Praise God. Sometimes I will call daddy and he will say, eh, what did you say? What did you say? That is not your place. Get up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Everything, everything doing me lives. I, then I, I myself will now go and face the world. In the name of Jesus. Kill them all shatter. Then I'm fine. Hallelujah. You need people to challenge you like that. Because they know who you are. Sometimes the enemy wants to paint a picture of who you are not. But they know who you are. And they can speak into that. And he does that for me whenever I speak it. Praise the Lord. And our mama is such a fiery woman of God. <laughs> I was saying to her today, that was awesome again. Because every time she speaks, she's just bringing something out of a deep place. She's a deep intercessor. So she's not just speaking. Hallelujah. I thank God for both of them. Thank you so much for being such wonderful parents. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. I thank God for all the men and women of God who are here. Wonderful people. Such humility. Thank God for your lives. Amen. I'm meeting Pastor Opie for the first time, even though I've seen her, you know, manifesting <laughs> on YouTube. On YouTube. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, manifestation of the sons of God. Hallelujah. But I thank God for everyone. For Pastor Lewis, you know, Pastor uh, Adebisi. I hope I'm not, or Labisi, you know, thank God for every one of you. I give God praise. My assignment, even though I've taken most of the time, I'm going to rush, is to speak on instruments of revival. And that is just me. That is just me. You know, I'm a revivalist. Hallelujah. You know, sometime last year, the Lord began to speak to us that, you know, a revival is imminent in this nation. And I am one of those that believe, that believe, that God did not bring me to the United Kingdom to just come and work and make money. I'm one of those that believe that God brought me here for this season, for a time like this, to come and spark revival in this nation. And I'm taking my assignment seriously. Praise the Lord. Because, of course, when we came to this country, my husband and I said, we are coming here, we will work for six months and go back to Nigeria and build a big house. We are still here to build a big house now. After 26 years of being in this country. And I'm not saying it's wrong to build a house, but, you know, God just took me away completely. It's like there's a reason I brought you here. Amen. I don't know if I'll be able to go through my notes the way I've written it, but I will speak. So, last year, somebody gave me a book called Prepare for Revival many years ago. It's in my cupboard. One day I looked at it and it jumped out at me. Prepare, you, prepare for revival. Prepare. And so the Lord began to say to me, I want you, I want you to start praying. In 2016, there was a prophecy that came that said revival is imminent in the United Kingdom. And one of the signs that God will give us is that we're going to see physical fires burning in the forests of this nation, which is very, very uncommon. This kind of things happen in California. It happens in America, but we don't get it in UK. So when that word came in 2018, it came in 2016. In 2018, there was a fulfillment of that. I don't know how many of you remember, those of you who live around Manchester area, the fire broke out. And the prophecy said they will find it difficult to quench it. It took them weeks to quench this fire. And when it happened, that was exactly what happened. Almost two weeks, the fire kept spreading and spreading. It's like, that is your sign. Hallelujah. Now, when those kind of things happen, you go back to ask God, what do we do? How should we position ourselves for this thing that you said is coming? 
Hallelujah. I didn't know what to do. I began to cancel all my speaking engagements. I began to cancel them. And I said, I can't come. I can't come. I can't come. I need to be in God's presence. I need to pray. Because something is about to happen and I don't know when. I just need to position myself so that it won't pass me by. I want to be right in the middle of this revival. And the Lord began to say, start praying. Three hours every day. I said, ah, okay. So I, I started praying and the Lord said, no. I want you to gather others to join you. Amen. And so last year we began praying. We did 70 days praying three hours every day. Because you know that no revival ever happens in any nation that is not preceded by prayer. No revival. Whether you are talking about the Welsh revival, Evan Roberts, you are talking about the Hebrides revival in Scotland, you are talking about the revival in Northern Ireland, no revival. Even the Azusa Street River, everything was preceded with prayer. And we began to pray. And as we began to pray, the Lord said increase it. We increased it to another 30 days, 100 days. We continued to pray. Then after that, some people started like, oh, wow, well, I'm tired. We continued every week. But while we were praying, I saw a vision. I saw a revelation and I saw the map of United Kingdom. And something that looked like a river of fire was coming from the north. And started coming so fast. And it came down and stopped at Bristol. And I opened my eyes. And I said, God, what is this? And of course, there were other things that were said, which is personal. And um, I began to pray about this. One day I checked the map of UK and I saw something that looked similar to what I saw in my vision. I saw something red, like a line coming to the, through the edges from the north down and stopped at Bristol. I'm like, okay, God, what are you saying? There was a prophecy that somebody called Jean Donnell. Now, if you're not from UK, don't worry, you can, you know, use it for any other nation. Jean Donnell prophesied in 1967 that in the United Kingdom, she saw what looked like fires all across the nation. Fire of revival. And, you know, as I kept reading those prophecies, it ignited something inside of me. And, you know, it's time that prophecies start coming to pass. It's time. We don't want to sit on them, but we want God to move as he has spoken in his word. And so we began to pray into this. And I said, God, if these fires are coming, there are some things that you don't just sit upon. You act. Today we've been hearing about acting. Yesterday we heard about acting. You know, Daddy Omole was saying that we need to enter the book of Acts. Yeah. Hallelujah. We need bold and courageous people now. No more weakness and timidity. Praise the Lord. When God speaks, we go, we are waiting for 21 million confirmations. Oh God, if that is you, let an, a pink elephant fly in the sky. Well, you know there's no pink elephant that will fly. Hallelujah. You already know. God is speaking. I don't know when God told Abraham whether he had, you know, a prayer group that confirmed for him to step out and go where he is. It's when we don't want to do something, I think, called confirmation. Confirmation. But you already know. So I said to my people, I said, you know what? God has already spoken to me to go to Edinburgh. He said, go to Edinburgh. So I said, you know, we're starting this fire train from Edinburgh. And we're walking our way down to Bristol. Hallelujah. See, we, we have to t make a move. We don't just wait for things to happen. We make them happen. There are some things that will not come to you. You have to go to them. Hallelujah. God is waiting on us. Because he has chosen us for this season. To spark a move of God in our cities. In our nations, our villages. They are waiting for us just like the, the man of God said today. They are waiting for us. And we're not going to keep wasting time. Some of those cities and villages, I don't know a soul there. And I say, God, if you want to really move in this nation, open the doors. So from March to May, we were going from city to city. Towns and villages. Hallelujah. With the message of revival. Wake up, church. Because God is coming. He wants to move. In this nation. Somebody said this nation has not seen a heaven sent revival in 100 years. 
in 100 years. This is the time. And some of us are saying, God, do it, what you've done before. Like Habakkuk said in the book of Habakkuk chapter 3, we have heard of your fame. We have known and seen what you have done before. Lord, do it again. Do it in our time. Do it in this season, oh God. We are contending for it, oh God. We are contending for it. It's time for it to be done in the name of Jesus. So we went from Edinburgh to Northumberland, from Northumberland to Manchester, to Wolverhampton, to Stoke on Trent. We were just going to crew. We we're just going. And God, we called it, and the fire fell. That is a statement of faith. Not God, let the fire fall. And the fire fell. Because we have been praying. Amen. It's time for manifestation. And in this season, we are going to be praying and going. So we are praying. We are praying. No, we are praying and going. We are praying and going. This is the time. Hallelujah. Amen. That God wants to do what he needs to do. And I thank God that all those places that we went to, people were ignited. The fire fell. And, I, and I'm praying to God. It's not going to be one of those falling down. And you get up and you are the same. And you go back and still do all those wicked things. No. Because when we have encounters with God, we are never the same. We are never ever the same. And I'm praying to God that that is what will happen to all those people. Some of them, the pastors were texting me and saying, thank you for coming. Because since you left, you must not leave any place. Just like mommy said this one. Don't leave any place the way you met it. Now people are awakening. The revival fire is falling. We have started prayer meetings. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about Caucasian churches. Hallelujah. We've started prayer meetings. Now morning and evening. Morning and evening. This was where there was zero prayer. Now morning and evening. Went to Wales. One woman said, I couldn't stop praying. I couldn't stop praying. I was just praying. I, when I was praying so loud. And I thought they would call the police. And I said, there's a spirit of prayer upon you. Amen. And I knew, I'm talking about instruments of revival. I know that I'm one of those. Because we need to know who we are. That God has called and chosen to be a revivalist. To be an instrument of revival. And you will not be the same like others. You will be different and separate. You cannot live the way others are living. Because God has chosen you, he has marked you for this season. Praise the Lord. So why do we really need revival? Because some people have used that word so much, I can't stand it. Many of them don't even understand what this revival is. Because revival is not only that the Holy Spirit comes and we fall down and get up. And we are having a good time. We have goosebumps. Revival is an awakening. It's God saying, wake up from your slumber. Wake up from your sleep. Wake up from apathy. Wake up from your indifference. Wake up from your prayerlessness. Wake up from your iniquity. And arise. Hallelujah. This is what God is saying to us. And I was praying and saying, God, I don't just want to say anything. What are you saying to the church at this time? The church needs revival. Revival needs to start with us. It starts with me. In my heart. It starts with my heart. The other day I was just thinking, I said, God, there are people that see all these angelic manifestations. They have heavenly realm encounters. You know, they do miracles, visions. Why is it that everybody don't see this? He said, impurity of heart. It's blocking. People's hearts are full of garbage. Full of junk. Things we don't need to think about. Things that does not concern us. There is even unforgiveness in people's hearts. So how are we going to be having heavenly realm encounters? Rather, we'll be having one masquerade chasing us everywhere. And that is not the will of God. Hallelujah. And so God is calling us back to the altar. He's saying that I want to start something and I want to start with you. I want to touch your heart. I want to melt your heart. I want to purify your heart. Today and yesterday, I was just praying, God, purify my heart. Purify my heart. I don't want to be thinking about rubbish. God has been warning me about vain imagination. 
vain imaginations, things that are not there. Pastor Opie mentioned it yesterday, and I thank God for that. As, you know, she, she broke those things down, but there are things that we need. Vain imagination. This person said, it. they didn't say it. It's your mind. It's your thought. You are the one thinking that. And the devil knows how to process that thing in you and captivate your mind to the point that you're actually feeling as if that thing is happening and it's not. And a lot of people have been bound. That's why we are pulling down strongholds of the mind. Because people have been bound. The enemy has come in through the mind. One of the ways he can enter your life is through your mind. What are you thinking about? There's a lot of traumatic situations happening in people's lives that is blocking them from experiencing the glory of God. Because we have allowed so many things to come in. I love what Pastor Opie said about her housemate. And I'm going to be mentioning, you know, some of the things other people have said. Because I believe God is speaking already in this conference. And if we have ears, we will hear what he's saying. For some of us, we don't need something mega. Just that little word of encouragement will break open something in our lives. That I, she said something. She said, it's not going to kill me to say good morning to my housemate first. So for those of us who have this issue with, you have to greet me first. I cannot greet you first. That is terrible. Don't you know I'm older than you? Don't you know I've been in ministry for 65 years? And you only just started two years ago. Why should I be the one to greet you first? All those things are irrelevant. I do understand that we need to respect our elders. Don't get me wrong. And we need to honor fathers and mothers and those who have gone ahead of us. But you see, some of these things are an issue. And when it becomes an issue in your life, the devil will make sure that he begins to captivate you and lock you up. And we don't want to be locked up. We want to be free. To move in the dimensions that God has already ordained for us at this time. Hallelujah. I'm going to read a scripture so that people will not say, oh, she didn't read the Bible. <laughs> Hallelujah, but I've been speaking the word. Amen. I was given this anchor scripture, 50, uh, Jeremiah 51 verse 20 to 23. Jeremiah 51, 20 to 23. The message I was given is so wide. The topic is so wide, so I'm just going to speak as I'm led. You are my battle axe and weapons of war. For with you, I will break the nation in pieces. With you, I will destroy kingdoms. With you, I will break in pieces the horse and its rider. With you, I will break in pieces the chariot and its rider. With you also, I will break in pieces man and woman. With you, I will break in pieces old and young. With you, I will break in pieces the young men and so on and so forth. You are God's battle axe. You are a weapon in the hand of God. You must realize that there is no weapon that works by itself. Somebody handles the weapon. Somebody holds the weapon. I've never seen a weapon dangling in the mid here saying, I want to walk by myself. And because somebody holds the weapon and you are God's battle axe, is holding you. You are in his hands and please stay in his hands. Stay in his hands. The hand of the Lord, when I read my Bible, speaks about the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the hand of God. So stay with the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit of God be the one that is moving you. Let the Spirit of God be the one that is directing and guiding and leading and using you at this season. In the name of Jesus. He said, you are my battle axe and my weapon of war. That means that you have been fashioned. All weapons are not the same. You have the sword, the javelin, the spear, axe, gun, all kinds of weapons, but they are not fashioned the same way. They were fashioned to do for a purpose, the purpose for which it was what? Created. Hallelujah. And so the way you have been fashioned as a weapon in the hand of God is because of the assignment that God wants to use you for. There are things that God has wired in you because of the, the things that you are going to begin to do and the places God has appointed you to be. Glory to God. So that is why you cannot compare yourself. You are different and you are unique. And that's why when I say that I'm a revivalist, there are some things that others are doing that does not move me. 
I look at it, I celebrate it, but that's not for me. That's not for me. And we need to understand that a lot of people have left their position. They have left their assignment because they are looking at somebody and saying their ministry is growing. They are bursting at the seams. But, you know, focus on what God has called you to do. Hallelujah. Because ministry is not about, I want to have the largest crowd. I want to be on TV. I want to have the greatest likes. It's not about that. Because some people will not be on TV. Until Jesus comes. It's not a cause. It's a fact. And the moment you accept that, the better. Some of you will not even have a mighty public ministry. It might be just in the closet. Groaning and travailing for the next move of God that is coming. And God understands that. Heaven records your voice. The Lord is pleased with you. But many of us, when we see somebody doing something, we say, I think I better change and do what they are doing because they are getting a lot of attention. But the attention we need is from heaven. It's from God. You are an instrument in the hand of God and God uses you the way he wants to. Not the way we think we should be used by God. Hallelujah. There are people in the body of Christ that they are, they are spoons. What do I mean by spoon? They are starers. They get to a place and just stare. Everything is said to, they stare it. They stare them out of their complacency. Stare them out of their sin. Hallelujah. So you need to recognize yourself. Who am I as an instrument in God's hands? They came to ask John the Baptist, are you the Christ? He said, no, I'm not the Christ. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the path of the Lord. It's important we recognize what God has called us to. I'm not going to be running around like a headless chicken because people are not applauding me. They're applauding somebody. It's okay. It's fine. Heaven is applauding. John the Baptist was a revivalist of his time. God used him. To bring the children of Israel out of their apostasy. Out of their sleep. And for some of us, our ministry is that. Our call is that. But that call is not fancy. It's not fancy. So we want to keep quiet. That call will attract enemies. That call will attract criticism. Hallelujah. That call will attract people saying, well, sorry, we thought you were going to preach us happy, but the message you preached... It's making everybody not want to come to church. So here is only 10 pounds honorarium for you. Because you, you drove away all our members. They didn't want to come to church because you spoke on holiness. And that is the problem we are having in the church. We are raising chickens instead of eagles. We are feeding their greed. We are feeding their ego. One of the things that the Lord began to say, you know, I'm just jumping from here to there because I believe God wants to say some things. Many of you are carrying that spirit of Elijah. The spirit of John the Baptist is a raw, it's a raw confrontational spirit. Raw. Hallelujah. And that is why as an instrument of revival, you must die. Die to yourself. Die to your ego. Die to your flesh. Whether they say, well done, that was good or not. In those days, when I finished preaching, nobody comes to say, that was good. I will feel so bad. One day, God said to me, you have a divided heart. I said, eh? Jesus, oh Lord. Yes. I told you to say something. Now you are going to ask everybody, how was it? How was it? How was it? So that they can say it was really good. Even if God is saying bad. But they are saying it's good and that's okay for you. Because somebody said, I don't want to be a woman of men, but a woman of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because it's not about what the majority says. Oh, well, I want to be in the Forbes 100 or 500. The 100th greatest speaker, woman, According to Forbes. No, according to heaven. 
Hallelujah. I want people giving all kinds of gifts and accolades. Oh, we want to recognize your work that you've done for 20 years. And I'm not saying it's wrong. But then somebody is sitting in the corner. Nobody recognizes them. Nobody gave them any award. And so they are feeling bad. A lot of people have stepped out of their calling and assignment just because of that. They want to come to a place of significance. And in quotes, relevance. And I'm not saying relevance is bad, but when that is your, the main reason why you are doing ministry, then everything is wrong. Everything. And that's why we are not having many revivalists and evangelists. Everybody is a pastor. Everybody wants to pastor for security. Because the tides are coming in. That is very, very secure. But an evangelist who has to go out they don't know where their next meal is coming from. So we need to die because some ministries are suffering. Some assignments are suffering because nobody is taking it up. Nobody is hearing the voice of God that is saying, I'm calling you now. Just like we've heard today, the sons of God need to manifest. There are some assignments that nobody, dangerous territories, dangerous zones, nobody wants to go there. Amen. There was a man who he was said, he, was, he said, I was called to to Sierra Leone. I've, call, I've been called there. So before I go, he started making sure everybody knows about it and starts sponsoring him every month. You know, everybody, you know, he was already making his own way. Because I, I thought we used to go by faith in those days. Hallelujah. In those days. But now, let me make it happen first. Let me gather, gather, gather before, you know. But you know, what God is saying to us, and I want to just move from, you know, I, I want to flow with what I've been hearing God saying since yesterday. It's like heavens are requiring people. Just like um, Evangelist Theodore would say, there's a wanted sign in the spirit. Wanted intercessors. I read his books, his book all the time. Hallelujah. There's a wanted sign. Nobody wants to do it because it's not, there's no money in it for me. And God is calling us at this time to hear what he's saying. What is heaven saying? Right now, I need men and women who are going to carry the burdens of revival. The burdens of an awakening. The burden of a generation. When Daddy Omole was speaking, I said it's because we don't have a burden. We don't have a burden. When the burden hits us, we will weep. We won't be able to sleep. We are praying and crying. Oh God, something has to happen. I can't eat. I can't eat. Because we don't have a body. May God impregnate us Amen. with his own burden. Amen. May God make us uncomfortable. Amen. May he agitate us Amen. from that place of complacency. We are by, we are now set. We are doing ministry in a comfortable environment. You know, God is staring us. I always say to God, I don't want to be a, a speaker that is going about everywhere collecting honorarium. You know, there's so, there must be much more than that. There must be more purpose than that. There must be something that I wake up in the morning and I say, this thing is burning in my heart. The United Kingdom must be saved. This nation must know God. The millions of Muslims in this nation that God brought to this nation. He didn't just bring them here. He so that they can encounter Jesus. So what am I doing in my life that I only sleep, wake up, go to work, sleep, wake up, go to work and eat and put my leg up and watch my favorite movie and eating popcorn. And there's a cycle. That's a wasted life. That's a wasted life. Amen. There are places that I've been invited to speak and I know the honorarium will be big and I canceled it. There's something more than that. There's something on the heart of God that he wants to do and he's saying, I need somebody who will stand for me. I need somebody who will go for me. But Lord God, no, I can't because all my diary is full. I can't. And that one, if you send me, they won't give me anything. Hallelujah. But that is not what God is saying now. There must be a shift. The way we do ministry needs to change. It's about God, not us. 
It's about God, not us. Sometimes the way we hold on to our ministry as if I was born with it. My father gave me. My great-grandfather gave him. So I'm holding on to it. But you know, I, I just laugh at some of the things we do. Because that ministry that was given by God, God can say, don't pass it on to your son. Hey, am I talking to somebody? <laughs> Wahala. Give it to somebody else. I've heard of people that they left the ministry. God told them, leave it. It has grown. Leave it. Ah, go and start afresh somewhere else. It's like, ah, no. My sweat. I built this thing. I. I built it from the ground. Which voice is telling me to now leave it? Or give it to somebody else? Because now it's you. It's not God. Now let me just move to some, another thing God was laying on my heart so strongly. And I will round up. Because there's no way I could actually finish this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There's so much to say. But one of the things the Lord was saying to me is that there's a generational gap. There's a generational gap and it's heavy in the heart of God. In Judges chapter 7, two, sorry, verse 7 to 10. It says, so the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. Who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old and then buried him within the border of his inheritance in the mountains of Ephraim. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. There's something wrong with this narrative. Something terribly wrong. A generation... A whole generation arose. They did not know the Lord, nor the works that he had done. That means somebody is not leaving a spiritual legacy. Somebody is not perpetuating a godly legacy. That means that we are co concerned about ourselves. We are not thinking about the next generation. God is a generational God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the patriarchs. Amen. When God met with Abraham, everything that he did with Abraham, including the covenant he caught with him, did not end with Abraham. There was a continuity of that legacy. With Isaac with Jacob. Now some of us have had ministries for 35, 40 years, and our children don't smell like us. They don't even look like it. They don't understand. It's as if we are speaking another language entirely. When they come to our churches, they're just staring. They don't understand what we're saying. They don't catch the same fire. They don't have the same zeal. They don't have the same burden that we say we carry because we have not transmitted it. We have not transmitted it to them. Some of us are so fighting for our ministries to be big and we're growing older. We're growing older and we're not thinking about the next generation. And I believe this is so strong on the heart of God. We are saying, God, we are revivalists. Well, we want our children to be revivalists. We want the next generation to be revivalists. Hallelujah. God was not a stranger to Isaac and Jacob. He wasn't a stranger because Abraham made them know him. Hallelujah. They also had a solid relationship with God, the God of their father. They knew God for themselves. Remember my son one time, he would tell me, oh, mommy, I want to know God for myself. I said, yes, that's what I want to. Know God for yourself. The God of your parents. You also must know him. One time I looked at my son, I, I saw there's a leadership quality in him. I said, I'm going to be mentoring you, whether you like it or not. Once a month, sit down. Because we go about mentoring everybody, the people in our own house. We are not passing on a spiritual legacy to them so that they can be on fire like us. Some of our children are not on fire. And so that's why I always say, God, ah, that means my fire is not, it's not, <laughs> if my fire is very, very strong, my children should have caught it. Am I talking to somebody? So, so, so I, I need that more fire because my children should, anytime you have fire, fire is contagious. Fire should spread. Anything around fire will catch it. 
So that means I need another dose, a higher dimension of this fire, so that my children will catch this fire. Glory to God. God give us foresight and wisdom to know how to raise a godly generation. The next generation that will perpetuate a godly legacy. We must not live for ourselves. We must move away from the trend of building a name and a portfolio. We are so busy doing that. While we are trying to build empires, make a name for ourselves, we are trying to be famous, competing with one another, we are losing a generation. Because many of us, well, most of us in this room are over 50, 60, some people going to 70. <laughs> in the next 30 years, I don't know what will happen. <laughs> eh? There's nobody 70. Ah, some people are close to 70 in this room. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know what will happen to our children in the next 30, 40 years. Because they don't carry the same passion we carry. They don't have the same fire. They are used to staying on their computer and playing games. I don't know what will happen. Whether those children of the bond women will come and want to take over. If persecution breaks out now, I don't know if our children are ready not to deny Jesus. Hallelujah. So all these things we are talking about, we don't want it to die when we leave. Because nobody is carrying this thing. And that is a burden on the heart of God. God will often make the children of Israel raise up a memorial. Why does he do that? So, so that when your children ask you, you will tell them. God is a transgenerational God. When your children ask you, you will tell them. Now I was discussing with somebody, I said, all these mega churches, mega ministries, if their leaders die today, I don't know what will happen to those ministries. I don't know what will happen. Because they are not actually living anything. They are not training. They are not raising. They are not, you know, uh, uh, pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. And God is calling us to wake up at this time. This is not what I even wanted to say, but God was saying, no, you need to say this. You need to say this. Hallelujah. We must think of what will happen to them. We need to start seriously, prayerfully thinking about how to raise the young people. To be lovers of God and not pursuers of vanity. We need to start. There was a church that just closed, they just closed down. Because all they are teaching the young people is how to make money. And when you keep hearing such things, greed. People now will want to get the money at all costs. And this is what we are saying. We need a revival generation. We need a generation that will know how to hear the voice of God. That will love God and spend time in his presence. That will have the fear of God in their heart. They will not do anything that will hurt God because they love him. A generation that you don't need to tell them don't do this. But because of that love of God, they will not do it. We need to check our messages and make sure that we are preaching the right thing. That will make these people strong and make them stand. Because some of the things we are giving them is making them weak. They are no more strong. But God wants to raise a strong generation. The Bible tells us in Psalm 145 verse 4, one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty works. Psalm 22 verse 30 says, a posterity shall serve him. It shall be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. Amen. Many times we say, oh, I want to leave a legacy for my children. Uh, I have bought you a house in uh, Lekki and a land somewhere in Ikeja. And then somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. And I'm not saying it's wrong. It's good to do that. But the greatest legacy you can leave for your children is make them know God. Introduce them to God. Walk with them to know how to spend time with God. How to love the things of the spirit. Those are the things that we should put place priority on. Hallelujah. Pray with them. Pray for them. Instruct them. Walk with them. That's why God said to the Israelites, put the word 
everywhere. This instruction I'm giving to you because I don't want it to fade away in the coming generation. Put it on the door, on the windows, everywhere. When you are sleeping, talk to them. When you are going out, talk to them. Hallelujah. No, but now we are talking to them only about the games. About Arsenal and Manchester United. Hallelujah. We need to talk to them. I was telling my son, I said, I want you to fast. Uh, mom, fast. And I'm on your case. Hallelujah. So I want you to pray in tongues for 30 minutes. I said, pray in tongues. That is how to pray in tongues for 30 minutes. Tell them what you are going through and how you came out of it. Tell them when you pray and God answers. Tell them I was praying in my room and the Lord spoke to me. Let them begin to get familiar with those terms. Not that there's a gap. Some of us are up there. Fire is coming out from us. Our children are down there. Some of them are even on drugs. God forbid. Hallelujah. There are bishops who have come to have to build their children out of prison. Because they are here, their children are there. Hallelujah. And I believe God is speaking to us, including myself. We need to do something about this. Hallelujah. God said to the children of Israel, Moses, I want you to write down this song. Write this song down. Deuteronomy 31, verse 19 to 22. For yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouth that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. You see, God told them to, that's why when we are writing songs, we need to know what we are writing. Those songs, we'll keep singing it and singing it to remind us what God is saying, teach it to the children. We need to recount the works of the Lord to them. We need to teach them the values of the kingdom of heaven. We need to teach them what is priority. You know, we need to teach them not to be selfish and self-centered, but to love the things of God. An average child now doesn't want to give. You have to say, have you given your tithe? Have you given your offering? It's like it's a hard thing. Hard. Because they don't have that heart. So we need to begin to pump that into them. We need to pass down those things. Teach them to prioritize God. Teach them to develop their own personal relationship with God. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop here because they've been telling me time is up. Hallelujah. Can we pray? Can we pray? They told me time is up, so I have to stop. Two minutes. Can we stand, please? As instruments of revival. God wants to use you to awaken a generation. God wants to put a sword in your mouth. God wants to make you a shofar that will blow the trumpet in Zion. God is raising up people. Now there will not be people who are selfish. There will not be people who are just doing ministry. This is assignment, and I'm ready to lose anything for it. Those are the kind of people God is raising up now. I'm ready to even lose my life. Because we are not training our children to be martyrs anymore. To die for their faith. To die for what they believe. We are so afraid of death. We are talking about that today. I die in the name of Jesus. I will not die. I will live. Okay, praise God. We will not die. We will live. But when it comes to the matters of the kingdom, weightier matters, that is going to make the uncircumcised talk about my God. Ah, no, I'm ready to lay down my neck. Hallelujah. Until we have people like that, we will not see moves of God that we want to see. So, God, you used Evan Roberts mightily. Go and ask what Evan Roberts did now. Because this man was praying for five hours every day. Couldn't sleep. And some of us is like, oh, I prayed for three hours. My blood pressure has gone up. I need to go and check. Please check. My blood pressure has gone up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> One lady was, and I'm not saying it's bad to do all this health eating. But it, come, it came to a point I was doing it and he was like, ah, hold on a minute. Please, this is not my God now. Uh -uh. I, I, I need to pray. He said, wake up in the morning and do this. I said, no, <laughs> I need to pray before I do that. <laughs> Praise God. 
Let God heal me. And if he doesn't want to heal me, so be it. I believe in healing. But I think what is happening is that we love our lives. We love it too much to part with it for what is important in the kingdom of God. Why is it that all these sons of the bond women, they came into the country, they want to take over. They didn't come here just to lie low. They want to take over. And they are paying. They want to have, you know, already we have, you know, one of them as mayor. Not only in London, in every place. And what are we doing? We are being regarding and saying, oh, we can't give that, we can't give that. They are eating our money. And these people will give 50,000 pounds. And one of their goals is to get to number 10 Downing Street. And we are there. We don't want to pray. Let's pray for three hours and push this person out. Ah, eh, you see, you see, sister, I have my own problem. See, um, I have this, I have that, I have this, I have that. God will help us. God is looking for people who forget about themselves. And take up the matters of God. God, I love you so much. Anything you want from me, I give it. Some people will say, how is it? You don't have a house. How can you not? You see, those are worldly ways of talking. Worldly. Because sometimes, Madam, Mother Teresa didn't have anything. But she did a lot. When Madiba was saying today that it's not about how much you can acquire, but how much you can give. We are letting the world dictate our lifestyle to us. No, by now, you should have had all your mates have three cars. Who, where did they write it in the Bible? No, I have chosen the higher way. Just like Jesus said to Mary, I have chosen the higher way. I don't have to have those things. I don't need them. We are talking about somebody who, they, they are millionaires, but they ride bicycle. In Nigeria, <laughs> they can't do that. They are riding bicycle. Ah, uh ah. -uh. You are more than this. Where? I chose it. Amen. It is not a spirit of poverty that brought me there. I chose it. <laughs> because of the kingdom. Because of God. Hallelujah. Now, a lot of things are left undone. Because we are clamoring for those things. We are working for those things. But God is looking for people that will Finally, let me say this. We had a meeting after that prayer uh, in May. There was one lady who came, a white lady. From the beginning of the meeting to the end, I didn't see her. She was under the chair. She was slain. When she got up, and that's what I'm saying, she left her flat in London and started going. Preaching the gospel everywhere. The fire got into her so much. She just left everything. And she was going. She got to a point, she got a canoe, a kayak. And she began to go on the kayak. Everybody she met, she was. We call the program Run With The Fire. Just like Daddy will always run. She ran, literally. She's preached to over a thousand people since that time. She's seen many people saved. If, if most of us are doing that, don't you think we would have reached the whole of our nations? She, she didn't care. And when she says, she'll say, well, oh, you're not married. Well, if God wants to marry, marry, if not, I don't care. That's not my concern right now. <laughs> but these are the things we carry on our head. We even have prayer meetings for wanting to get children. Wanting to get, and I'm not saying it's wrong. Please, oh, don't quote me. Wanting to get husband. Husband getting prayer meeting. Raga, bada, bada, bada. But when they say pray for souls, ah, <laughs> hey, don't understand. Don't understand. You know, my family is complaining. You see, those are worldly mindsets. And they are dragging us into it. So now we've turned church into that. It's all about that now. I remember saying to somebody yesterday that a man came to a church for four weeks. For four weeks, all they were talking about was money. After the fourth week, he came to the man. He said, you know what? I'm rich. I don't need money. I'm looking for salvation. You have not preached one message of salvation since I entered this church for the four weeks I came. I don't need the money. I'm already rich, but I'm looking for God. Can I find him here? Hallelujah, because the messages have turned into purely no Christ, crossless, godless messages, which have no power to save anybody. 
Hallelujah. May God begin to change our orientation. May we go back to the cross. Go back to the center of our faith, which is Jesus Christ. And let us stop preaching all this motivational nonsense. Let them go and learn it in school. Let them give, us the, give them the raw gospel, the message of Christ, because we have no time. The time is short. The Lord is coming very soon. And we need, there's still a lot of people out there who don't know Jesus. They've not heard. They, they don't, they, in fact, there's some people, they've never preached to their neighbor. Their neighbor sees them, but they've never said anything. And the neighbor doesn't even know they're Christians. Oh God, we're talking about revival. Lord, take us back to what our faith really means. It's not just about needs. We have reduced it to that. That is wrong. Hallelujah. It's about Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we raise our hands and just... I don't even know how to pray. But let's just talk to him. Let God begin to demolish our structures. We have raised and built on godly structures. And we want the spirit of God to inhabit it. But he can't. Lord, we surrender. We need to die to ourselves. Die to our selfish ambitions. It's all for you. I want to do something for you, not for me. For your glory. Talk to God right now. Thank God all the ministrations have happened at the beginning. Oh, yes, God. Let's surrender to him. Let's make up our minds that God, I'm not going back to business as usual. I'm not going back to the way I used to do things that does not glorify your name. This is the beginning of a new era in God. Some of us started out preaching those messages, but because we are mocked, because people laugh at us, we left it. Go back to it. That is your calling as an instrument of revival. Rabo Shata. An instrument of revival is one that will love God, passionate about God. That is on fire. Oh God. Some of us are seeking power, but we have left the person of the Holy Spirit. Without knowing his person, we can't get his presence. Without his presence, we can't get his power. Yes, Lord, we worship you, Lord. Oh, we lay ourselves on the altar. We surrender. You are looking for surrendered lives. People who are ready to do anything for you. They are not afraid of their lives. It's all about you, yes, God. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made. It's all about you. It's all about you. Oh, sing, oh God, I'm coming back to the heart. It's all about you. Let's go. About you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it go. And it's all about you. Hallelujah. It's all about you, Jesus. I want you to pray and say, God, make me an instrument of revival make me an instrument for your glory if there's any assignment that is on your heart and you are looking for somebody to give and everybody has been running away give it to me give it to me give it to me, it to me. It to me. It to me. please pray 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 that prayer come on let's pray let's pray let's cry out to God Koriba shata malaba se tobo reketeba. 
Hallelujah. There are some of you, you already know that God's hand is on your life <laughs> as an instrument of revival. God has chosen you not to live an ordinary life. He has chosen you to be different. You are going to say some things that will be like a sword in people's heart and will begin to change their lives and bring them out of their darkness. Please, I would like you to come forward. In two minutes, we're going to do this. Just present yourself to him. Present yourself. It's not about... I don't... I'm not laying hands on anybody. For you. Because while you are in front here, there is something God will do in you that will make you strong. You will set your face Better like a flint. The things going on out there in the world will mean nothing anymore. Nothing to you anymore. For you. Oh. to God. Let's surrender. Let's give him ourselves. Give him. Lay yourself on the altar. Say, God, here I am. I give you my life. Completely. Completely. I'm not taking it back anymore. My life in order for you. I want to burn for you. I want to know your heart. I want to know your way. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to see you. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart. Please talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Let the Lord begin to mark your heart. Let him put an incision on your heart. Let him circumcise you. Present yourself as an offering. And let the Lord take the light in it. Give yourself and say, God, I'm ready to be an instrument in your hand. That you're going to use for this end times. I separate myself. I separate myself. I consecrate myself for you. Hey, I want to know your heart. I want to know your way. I want to know your let your glory. You are on this altar making decisions, telling God. I want to for that which you have been telling me, you have been calling me, and I have I not responded. It's time. You. It's time. Give me the grace. Some of you are going to be praying for revival and a move of the Spirit of God yes. in the church. May that spirit of prayer. For Give yourself to him and let him use you. God is calling some of you now. Some of you are going to operate in power dimensions. Some of you are atmosphere changers. Atmosphere changers. Revivalists. Some of you are going to be flooded with the Holy Ghost so much. There's some of you here that every time you make a decision that I want to start living for God totally, something appears and keeps pulling you back. In the name of Jesus, I cancel that from your life. I break it off your life. I put a word between you and that thing now. I shut the door against it. In the name of Jesus, Amen. I pray that the spirit of Elijah come upon you. Amen. The spirit of John the Baptist come upon you. Amen. So you can walk in the power of Elijah. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. 
Ah, Lakosha. Let a new hunger rise up on the inside. Yes. Hunger for righteousness. Pause for the things of God. Rise up on the inside. Let that hunger press you and drive you to your knees. In the name of Jesus. Lord, everything you have released in this atmosphere for these instruments of revival, Lord, let you rest upon them. Let you rest upon them. Let you rest upon them. You have already spoken to them with your word. And we know something is changing on the inside. Breathe, breathe. I want to stop and I just feel something is happening in the lives of these people. Breathe. Breathe. Just breathe your name. You are giving it all. Giving it all. Giving it all. Give it all totally. Yes, Lord. Just hey, is your name. Breathe the Lord. Come breathe upon us. Ask the Holy Ghost to breathe upon you. Ask the Holy Ghost to breathe upon you. Ask the Holy Ghost to breathe upon you. Rather, that will let it tell you. I see a fire, the fire. I see fire coming upon you in a way you cannot contain. God is going to use you in a mighty way. The fire enveloping you, engulfing you, surrounding you so much. When you speak, fire will come out. Lord, let that fire fall, fall. Liver, liver, liver. Hey. 